Hello, I'm Ash Quigley and welcome to Take Back Your Mind, the place where we hear real stories from insightful and inspiring individuals about how they've reclaimed their own minds and lived life to its fullest. In these conversations, you'll hear people across many different walks of life sharing what it means to be human and how they navigate their inner and outer worlds with a little more ease and intention. Now, today we'll be joined by Christine Jackman, a journalist and author of a book that I constantly return back to called Turning Down the Noise. In fact, I actually received this book as a Christmas present a few years ago. And after not being able to put it down, I finished it in less than a day and finally signed up for a 10 day silent retreat, which was something that had been on my bucket list for a very long time. Now, I'm not saying or promoting that we all need to go and do that after watching or listening to this chat, but Christine does a, share a lot about the best ways to regain clarity and peace of mind in a busy and noisy world, something that I feel is hugely important these days. So I am truly delighted to have her join us and share her wisdom after many years of research and personal exploration, which no doubt we will dive into today. So let's get into it. Christine, it is such a pleasure to have you part of Take Back Your Mind. Welcome. Hi, Ash. I love it. I'm so excited about this. Awesome. Well, with the theme being exactly what it is, to take back your mind, I thought it's important that with each of our guests throughout this series, as they join us, uh, we would do a brief check-in. And so you could have that opportunity to check in with yourself and see how you're doing today. So if we were to say a scale of one to 10, where one is fairly flat, 10 is feeling super energized and motivated, where do you reckon you're sitting today? Yeah, I love the idea of checking in regularly. Um, and so I'm in that spirit, I'm going to be honest, I'm having a bit of a five day today. I haven't had had a couple of nights of not great sleep um, for a few reasons, floating around in the house with some child dramas. And so, yeah, started off probably lower, but it's, I, it's amazing sitting back here. At, I have this lovely desk looking out on the nature reserve that we live on. And it's incredible just the minute you look at trees and sky rather than, you know, a wall or a screen, how much, you know, how much energy you get just out of that. Amazing, that instant lift just mm. from incorporating something so simple. Mm. Well, as I mentioned, thank you for joining us. As, as part of the intro, I shared a little bit about you and the work that you do and how your book, particularly Turning Down the Noise, really was an inspiration for me. But for those who may not know you or maybe coming across the work that you do for the first time, can you tell us a little bit more about you and I guess your journey up until this point? Yeah, sure. Um, I was a... A journalist for most of my life. I um, grew up in Brisbane and my first, I started at a newspaper in Brisbane and my first posting was to New York as a foreign correspondent, uh, which was huge. Loved it. Um, really just, I arrived in New York and thought I'm never leaving. Um, but, you know, work continues and I've worked in the Canberra Press Gallery and in Sydney. Um, but I guess that's my CV, but what drives me or was driving me at that point is I'm a real, I think like a lot of women, um, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, which was the beginning of that sense that women could have it all and do it all, and which was great, except I think it's left this legacy of, you know, very, very, very busy, being very busy all the time and constantly thinking you need to do more. And I guess also um, I grew up as being a bit of a approval seeker and perfectionist anyway um, for lots of different reasons. And so a lot of my life was just, I look back now and just like running madly, sort of what do I have to do next? What do I have to do next? Um, until I uh, left journalism and was headhunted into political consulting from a strategic communications perspective and then worked for a very big business um, industry group where I was reporting to the um, you know my board was the top sort of CEOs of some of the top uh, businesses around the country really big 
And in many ways, that was like, that was about, that was 2016, I guess. Um, it was the peak, you know, you sort of think, wow, okay, so the career's on the move. Um, we were st- we moved to Sydney. Uh, we were living sort of on, on, on the harbour, not right on the harbour, but close enough. Um, you know, it was one of those situations that you grow up seeing in my era. It was the shoulder pads, you know, the women looking very important. You know, I was flying all over the country. I often joke I had two phones. That means you're really important because you can't just have one. Everybody has to be able to get you all the time. Um, but there were a couple of things that were just really good red flags, I guess, looking back. And, I mean, one of them was I got would get home every night and um, walking through the door at night, um, just the noise of my kids, I have two boys, or my partner or a dog greeting me was almost like physically painful. I was so overstimulated, I can say now. I just, I, I, and I was snapping because I couldn't cope with any more. Um, and also I was constantly just slightly unwell. I never felt really super energetic or and healthy so I was having like sinus infections I wasn't sleeping very well um you know I was looking into my health constantly getting things like blood tests and you know had a sleep test had a sinus test um and then one day Ash it's interesting it, it was one of my that I write about in the book um a little uh, another light bulb came on because I had a GP say to me oh look you know good news all your blood tests have come back you know clear you're healthy and I thought but I feel really unhealthy and I said that to her I said but that I, why do I feel so bad if I'm and she she sort of sat back and she said this was you know sort of Mossman Neutral Bay North Shore very affluent area and she said you know, I have a lot of patients like you. She said, mostly they're sort of lawyers or senior execs. And she said, you know, they're all just sort of, they're really busy and they don't feel very well. And she left it at that. And I've often wondered, because we moved sort of a little bit, bit after that, but that's what started me thinking, is this, is my body actually having a really healthy reaction to a really unhealthy situation and and life you know we're all so busy rushing around and the quality of life just doesn't exist and that's when I started thinking about what I described it as noise the noise in my life of constant you know queries phone calls emails um, demands um, noise around me living in a city, noise of the open plan office and meetings and things like that. And of course, the noise of this stuff, the phone with the pings and bings. And that's when I started thinking I need to turn, I, don't, I didn't even know what it meant before the book came out, but turning down the noise was became an obsession. How do I do that? So interesting, isn't it? Of how in society, what we perceive as being success, you know, on paper, the high flying corporate job, the two phones, all of the things, but how deep down you knew something inherently wasn't right. And I, I'm listening to you and obviously I had read the book, but I, again, I'm actually feeling it within, I know I'm feeling a reaction in my own body because I, I know that feeling so well. I, I know straight out of uni, I landed a job in marketing um, for the Coca-Cola company, which was, you know, one of the top jobs that you could get straight out of my, or out of uni. And like that, flown all over the world on paper, it was like, oh, she's 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 made it, you know, she's she's yeah. on her way, you know. And I was miserable. And like that for yeah, that job in and of itself only lasted a year, but um I went on to further jobs within the corporate world and that same feeling would come, you know, my friends and family were saying, Oh, she's doing great. You're doing amazing. And I just felt like I felt constantly at ill ease, like mm, at a, yes. a swarm of disease, which eventually did lead to disease and 
burnout and all the things that come with that but I remember that feeling of just never feeling well like I never felt like I was bursting with energy I would nearly fall asleep at the drop of a hat wherever I was was and like that on my bloods where it looked okay um but I was like this can't be it this surely can't be it so it takes it takes a lot of um I would say almost courage to actually explore that feeling. And I often say that to people because we, I think it's important to remember often the first thing you'll think is almost a shame. I'm not coping. There's something wrong with me. Every, this is what, because you've been told this is success. It's held up as success. You might have people who are dependent on you as I did. I was a single mum for 10 years so obviously financial security was a big issue and I was, had jobs that were financially, you know, really rewarding. So I think it does take a lot of courage to actually explore that and think, what does this mean? Um, and often you'll get messages that, you know, maybe you're just being a bit self-indulgent um, or the quick fix, go away and do a health retreat or go away and or go on a you know there's a reason um prescription antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications the prescriptions are going through the roof because it's almost like a you know well quick get back on that conveyor belt here's something to keep you propped up there's a I, I keep thinking there was a ad ad for um one of the flu cold and flu medications and the ad the song was soldier on Soldier on, like the Codrol, the Australian audiences will remember that. And of course, that message was, is, you know, rather than say, I have a cold, my body needs to rest. No, no, I take a drug and get back to work, which was that the, the core of that ad. So, yeah, I say to people, you know, the first, first and foremost, don't feel bad and don't feel shame. It's the first step towards listening to what you know your body and your I'd say spirit is trying to tell you absolutely um you mentioned there you know that constant quest to turn down the noise why do you feel it's so necessary these days what do you from you know your research but also your own specific journey and experience what is that assault on our senses and our attention ha- having what kind of an effect is that having on mm. our brains and our lives and our relationships well in the my book I trace because one of the things just so that your listeners know is that I eventually quit my big job and being a journalist and an author by background I decided I convinced a publisher I wanted to go on this journey and really explore what was going on So I'm lucky that, you know, somebody said, okay, off you go, go and make that your job for a while. And one of the first things I looked at was that, you know, human beings, we forget we're animals. We're, you know, we're creatures that have come through millennia of um, of, uh, evolution. And when you start thinking about that, you think about, well, what was our body designed to do? What did we, what are we most used to doing? And I trace that the history of firstly auditory noise, um, what we're used to picking up with that sense of hearing. And really, if you go through human history, there are little blips where the actual physical noise around you, around us has gotten louder and louder. And there was a big blip during the industrial revolution because suddenly more people were living in cities. There were factories with factories and the electric light and things that people started working longer. Um, there was this boom in, in, in the sorts of work where people were doing. So people left farms, they left the land and they moved to big cities. So that's the first big, really big wave of noise and big change. Now that's only about 250 ish years ago. So that's not very long in the, in the, um, in the history of human evolution, but we've kind of reacted to that. We've started to, you know, evolve towards that, but we're still not used to having um, noise at night. Um, That's one thing that's really interesting is um, that we picked up that even if you think you've had a good night's sleep, if somebody whacks a head um, heart monitor on or um, a, um, 
EEG or something to monitor your brain waves, and they've done this only in recent years, they can do this. They can pick up how you will come out of sleep because if there's street noise out of the outside or other other sorts of things. Now, at one level, that doesn't really matter, but what it tells you is that the human animal, because again, your hearing was a sense that um, protected you. There's a reason you don't have ear lids like you have eyelids. It's because your body is designed that hearing is the one thing that when you're asleep, um, stay switched on. So if you're living in an urban environment, particularly, um, and the book has some stati statistics that I'm not going to be able to remember now, but you know you only have to be exposed to a certain amount of noise over, say, eight hours, and your body will start becoming elevated, even at a sort of underlying level. Um, and most, many of us, if we live in the cities, we're going to have that traffic noise all the time, things like that. Now, then fast forward beyond that, the other big surge of noise in terms of, it's a slightly different form of um, noise, but I consider it the same, is we start seeing a big difference in terms of brain activity and stimulation with the introduction of computers. And then, of course, in late 2000s, 2007, um, Steve Jobs held up the first, I get to do it again, you know, mobile phone, smartphone. And what that did is it meant it, it had a huge impact on our exposure to light, on our exposure to alerts, and basically our 24-7 patterns. More than anything else, the um, impact of, of um, smart devices around us have just, you know, it, it's almost, I don't want to be um, overstated, but it is catastrophic in terms of the change in stimuli that we're feeding into our human animal brain um, and expecting it to adapt to, you know. And we know we don't, no, nothing is, no animal is capable of adapting to such a radically different stimuli that quickly. So you start seeing all sorts of um, strange symptoms of just, as you said, disease of reactions. And that's the sort of, that's the other look, sort of noise that I look at is the exposure to um, constant input um, that comes from this tiny little thing that we can carry around with us. And there's all sorts of interesting statistics about um, how, um, we're just not, we're not designed to cope with that. And what's more, the difference, because people will tell you, well, you've always had radio, we've had TV, not always, but, but the difference with what we've got now is that we have some of the smartest human beings are ending up in Silicon Valley with the explicit task of design algorithms, a word that most of us didn't know when I was going to school, it was a maths term. Now, Algorithms are about what drag you back in, drag you back in, drag you back into social media particularly. And, you know, to be fair on ourselves, we're not really equipped to, you know, they're designed to hook us, addict us, give our brains little shots of um, dopamine when you get a like or something, um, to raise anxiety so that we'll keep looking if we're not getting the responses we want. Um, so in many ways, I think we're almost becoming like those rats that you used to learn about in science experiments, you know, where if you touch one button, you get an electric shock. And if you touch another, you might get a pellet of food. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, that, that's a blink of an eye in human history. Um, and yet I don't think most of us are giving, are even aware or prepared to give ourselves a moment's breath to go, hang on, maybe, maybe there's a reason that I'm feeling distressed, unsettled, nervous and anxious, that's, you know, that's fairly insidious. Mm. It's interesting, like you've raised a few points there, which mm. <laughs> have really, no, I, I'm wonderful and really insightful and something really to ponder on and have a good think about. But I mean, that, that notion, firstly, of us being 
animals at heart and we are adaptive but the the changes that have happened which are so significant and how we haven't caught up with the pace and um, but also I guess the addictive nature of a lot of the stimulation that is coming our way and um, the different types of stimuli that how we're at a point where we can't cope but we're so addicted that yes. we can't stop and I know before we jumped on to, to hit record with this, we had a little bit of a, a conversation about why it is that we find it so difficult to re resort back to quiet and space. Why do you think we have such an aversion when we know in our heart of hearts, that's exactly what we need? <laughs> <laughs> why do you think that we find it so hard to actually just <sighs> be with ourselves? It's, isn't it interesting that you just, that phrase, be with ourselves, I found that fascinating. It occurred to me while I was writing the book that we live in the era of the selfie and yet um, we don't actually want to be with ourselves, not ourselves without, you know, without a curated self. Um, and, in fact, there's a really interesting study uh, that I think was done at Stanford, my, I think it was Stanford, um, that I quote in the, in the book, where they took uh, a group of men, a group of women, and they put them individually, like by yourself, in a room. I, and before they put them in the room, in each in a room, they gave them a, a, an electrical shock, enough to be painful, but not enough to be, <laughs> not enough That's to kill you. <laughs> But everybody agreed, I would, you know, I don't want to have that shock again. I'd pay not to have that shock. And the point of the um, exercise was you went into a room that was bare and you all you had to do was sit there for 15 minutes. And if you wanted to come out, you had to administer, uh, you could come out after 15 minutes or um, if you wanted to come out earlier, you could administer an electric shock and it would unlock the door. Um, and something like... I think it was two thirds of men and not as many women. It may have been a significant chunk of women, maybe a quarter, it might've been closer to a half, administered that shock because that 15 minutes, 15 minutes of being alone by themselves was considered less painful than an electric shock. And I will say that often I get asked the question, why do you think there was a gender difference there? And I, I said, well, I, I guarantee that some of those women went into that room and went, a quiet space away from children <laughs> so I'll have a little nap but on a more serious point yeah I think it's because again I mean, one of the ways to make sense of why are we uncomfortable with it partly evolutionarily you know for most of human history we while we are social animals we would have been outside at a diff working at a different pace alone with our thoughts because, you know, we didn't have, um, you know, constant music or access to constant information. Um, you know, if you consider, you know, farmers or things like that, often alone, you know, ploughing a field or whatever, maybe conversation with one or two other people, but that's not going to be constant. So most of the time it was a fairly quiet existence compared to what we have now. So I think that's the first, the first level of why are we uncomfortable with it is that physically we're just, you know, the, the body and the senses aren't used to that constant level of stimulation and input. And then I think the second thing is if you're living in a sort of a capitalist economy, and I can only speak to that, all of the messages you get from a social perspective or the majority of them are, you know, your value is about being productive. You know, so sitting and doing nothing, you know, you almost can have a panic because all, so many messages you get are about doing something for whether it's productive in terms of work or let's face it, how many of us, you know, are told, you know, that if you're going to exercise, I've heard this so many times, and I used to do it, you're not just going to go for a run or a walk. Oh, I'm going to go and train for a marathon or try, you know, I'm going to do a triathlon. It's never good enough to just do something because you enjoy it. You have to be achieving another goal. Um, 
So I think there are lots of reasons that when you begin to pull them apart, um, but where you can't rule out that socialisation factor. I mean, the way we push kids through school as if, you know, you have to learn this and the next thing for that, I've got a son who's about to do his senior. And the message, the overwhelming message the schools are still giving these kids is, you know, you have to get a high ATAR to get into uni. Um, it's like that production line um, approach. Uh, so, you know, is it any wonder that they keep, they churn out the other end and then a lot of kids will have, I know I did, it sounds like you did, you get to a point where you think, hang on, what, wh who am I and why am I doing this? You do, and I feel like I actually got that visual there of being on the production line and just taking a step back and just watching everyone else yeah. going, what is this? Where, where did I end up? You yeah. can actually really physically see that. It's interesting. Um, yeah. I guess the converse being the, the non-doing or the quiet, I know for you personally, having read a lot about your own journey, you undertook a lot of wild and wonderful experiments and experiences um, on your own personal conquest. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you did and more importantly, I guess, what you learned? Ah, oh, thank you. Um, yes, well, I did. I can break it in some ways into two particular types, again, with the auditory noise and also the stimuli of, of brain and di stimuli of um, digital noise. So I hiked, I, there's a, I, I made contact with a man um, called Gordon Gordon Hempton, who's an acoustic ecologist, whose campaign for the last 15 or so years has been to pervert, preserve truly quiet spaces. Gordon travels around the world um, recording sound for movies and video games and soundtracks and all sorts of things. He's one of the most sought after people who does this, but he, his story, the way he tells it is that, you know, over the course of that career, he noticed suddenly that in the United States where he lives, there were fewer and fewer places where he could record 15 minutes of, nor of sound without a man-made noise. So traffic, um, aircraft noise, um, mining noise, which often happens at a very low level, but you can pick up if you're out in the in the wild. Um, and that started to worry him. He created a, a list of, um, of the last great, he came up with a dozen in 2005. And one of the places as part of his campaign, he designated in the Pacific Northwest um, of the United States. Um, it's a beautiful big rainforest um, called the Olympic National Park. And a part of that national park in the Ho River Valley is, a, um, is one of the last places where he said you could record um, 15 minutes of, he called, it, he, he called it one square inch of silence. He designated it as one square inch of silence. It's not silent, there is, running water and it rains a lot there which is why it can be so quiet because people don't go there so I hiked in there um, just so that if for some people it might help to visualize it um, that area is where the twilight films <laughs> were shot so full of those really tall ancient trees um, like enormous trees and thick because they're so big and so thick, the ground, even when it snows, it will stay cold and you don't get a lot of undergrowth, but you get this really thick moss, which absorbs all the sound. Um, so, so yeah, I hiked into one square inch of silence just to see, and of course you can't get reception even if you try. So just being out in nature for that amount of time by myself, because I'm not, a, I wasn't a nature girl, um, was just, astounding um it sounds crazy but being surrounded by these enormous trees that are like that have been many of them have been alive for longer than there have been white people in Australia you know and just it is Im almost impossible once you sit and you're surrounded on your own by these trees that are like, like out of a fairy tale there is something I found just incredibly moving and also strangely comforting in a way that you think these trees have been here and just endured. 
they don't care, you know, for a journalist what's in the paper the next day or for the Coca-Cola marketing executive, how much Coke you sold last week or whatever. They're just here, present. And it's so quiet. And you can start to tune in to animals and, again, recognise that there are all sorts of creatures around you going about their daily life. And that's the other thing. There was a physical sense in me that I think you start to get in contact with the animal part of you. And what I mean by that is we revert very quickly into our animal senses, which are our, our senses are designed to unfurl, to be stretching out and taking in what's all around us beyond a room, beyond, a, beyond your backyard. And it's, there is great neuroscience to show that how your brain actually does really lovely things when it's um, in green space because at some ancient level it likes to track the shapes and the, um, the movement of trees. It's not like staring at a white space. There's enough interest there in your, to, give, to give your brain something to do um, but without sort of constant activity and that's actually they found it's actually the brain actually it's like having a lovely green bath so there's there, there is good science to show that it actually does make you feel good it lowers forest bathing a research in japan and north and south korea shows similarly you start to all sorts of chemicals um that um are involved in things like inflammation bad bad things um they start to lower if you're around uh, trees in this case. Um, and there are different reasons that they're starting to research as to why that is, but just sort of half an hour regularly of that can lower the state of your, um, you know, your markers for things like cancer, things like, um, so that's a good sign. Um, and so that I discovered I, that spending a lot of time in nature really genuinely did have a great impact on me. Who knew? Um, as long as you take your iPod earpods out again. Um, and yeah, so I explored a lot of the science in the book around why that would be. But the flip side um, is I started um, really looking into meditation, digital detox, and then proper meditation, silent meditations, which is, um, yeah, which is a whole other area of amazing um uh well now we're seeing neuroscience in it that um that that proves that you know those ancient traditions of monks you know there's a reason why those guys were living until they were 150 or whatever there's a reason why the Dalai Lama is always laughing you know um but quite seriously it's only been in the last 10 to 20 years that we've had the sort of neuroscience where we can track what goes on in the brain when people really experience meditators meditate but again, um, if you can strip out and learn to still the voices that are, go inside your head, um, again, the value in terms of um, health and well-being and what's happening and what happens in your brain is amazing. Um, so what I did just to experience at first is I went and stayed with um, silent, um, a silent retreat in um, northern uh, northern. Um, uh, California in Big Sur um, and then while I was there I discovered that actually one of the leading writers in that area of um, uh, monastery your know, silent monastic re um, retreats is actually an Australian monk lives in Victoria so I could have saved myself the trip but it was great and then eventually I went on a 10-day Vipassana which I'm happy to talk about if you'd Please like. Please do, would love to hear more. <laughs> Who knew, who knew? I feel like I'm talking too much. Uh, it's, it's no, right. it's very insightful. Um, yeah, so um, meditation, I mean, I'd, I'd been introduced to meditation because I used to do a lot of yoga and I still would love to be doing more yoga. Um, and I'd done a bit of guided meditation, but silent meditation of the, of the type that's known as Vipassana is taught through um a 10 day, usually a 10 day retreat of complete silence um, 
where there's a few rules, you're um, segregated, so men and um, women are separated. Uh, you live in complete, you take, yeah, you, you live in, it's not just silence in terms of not speaking, but you're encouraged um, to not communicate with each other in any way. So, you know, eye contact is to be avoided, no writing, you leave, you're not allowed to bring books or writing implements. Um, so you really are, and normally a Vipassana retreat, in Australia at least, will be somewhere like out in a bush somewhere. Although the traditions come from, you know, there are plenty of monasteries in the middle of places like Bangkok or, you know, in Asia where it's practised normally. And pretty much you sit for, you know, up to 10 hours a day on a meditation stool or cushions you, and you receive a training, training in watching the breath, anapana, and for three days, that's pretty much all you do is focus on your nose and feel the feeling of oxygen going in and out of your nose. And if that's sounding terrifying, <laughs> I think what's interesting about it is they, you start with those three days because anything more, if you weren't focusing on that, I think it had just become overwhelming. You just, it, it, you, you need to feel, you need to start stripping away all of the other layers of distraction. So, and, and getting very, very back into your own body. At least that's what I discovered when I was doing it is how out of my body I was used to being. And when I say out of my body, for me, it's in my thoughts, it's lost in thought. Um, and then from day four onwards, you start to do a sort of a body scan um, Again, being aware of the sensations in your body. But ultimately, the idea is to, once you've gone to that level of quiet, you can start to hopefully observe thought um, because the person that teaches that a thought sensation is just like another, it's like a itch or a, or a dribble of sweat. You can treat your thoughts like there's a thought. I don't have to respond. I can just... Just as I don't respond to the itch, I can just observe it. Um, or in my case, the agony of a shoulder. <laughs> Most people who do Vipassana, I find there is one thing that they find is their bugbear. Um, and I have to say that it changed. I mean, Vipassana, I did it in Tasmania in um 2018 I think um and I can say even now it's it changed my life because it reset in it sort of integrated into my body that recognition of of being able to watch thoughts rather than engage with them which is the essence of meditation really um and for people who might be listening who haven't meditated a lot or who have meditated but not um, experience that um, there's a wonderful description used um, I think it's by Tim Ferriss who wrote the four hour work week, week and other things he describes it as being that your hair your, in your brain his brain was like a washing machine with all sorts of clothes going on around inside it um, and me, all meditation did let's think of it as a frontal front loader is it moved him it gave him the ability to move to the other side of the front loader door so he could see everything going on around and inside, but he wasn't part of the jumble. And I love that because I think what people often, people often feel like they're a failure at meditation if they have a thought. They think that's the aim is to completely remove thoughts from your head. Um, and it's not that at all. It's that the real value comes in the practice of recognizing, oh, I'm lost in thought, and then starting again, returning to your breath, returning to just a calm awareness. Um, and I think the value in terms of turning down the noise is not what happens on the meditation stool. I know you'll have heard this before or on the meditation cushion but what happens off it. So suddenly, not always, but you can find yourself in a situation where you would have immediately reacted 
you can have that one moment of thinking, oh, I'm feeling really frustrated right now. Or, oh, I want to jump in with a reaction right now, but it's okay just to, just to wait and watch and, and let, things, let things settle or just watch and see. And I think that in terms of the value of that, it, it removes us from what we are in to go back to when we live in a noisy, overstimulated world, what we're actually doing with our brains and our bodies is constantly expecting them to respond like that. So anything we can do to either remove the stimuli like a digital detox or help train ourselves, that even if we are exposed, because we can't all go and live in a silent retreat for the rest of our lives, if we can help train ourselves and our minds to be better at not immediately reacting, um, again, the health and well-being benefits are enormous and we're starting to see that with the science that we can use to study them. I'm really glad that you, you brought that up because I think a lot of people who might be listening is like, that's all very well and good, but <laughs> I can't get off to a monastery or a 10-day silent retreat. How do I find my way of turning down the noise in the midst yeah. of the busyness. So, um, yeah, that was a really, really interesting uh, point to make. With, no, with, I was um, just going to say, it's really, it's so important. And part of the reason I wrote the book the way I did is that I wanted to acknowledge that particularly for women, we are on, we don't, you don't have to be perfect at any of this stuff. So by the end of my book, I have this section on, what I call slivers, slices and slabs of silence, little things you can do because the little things sometimes like what you can do in the car after you've dropped the kids off to school or before you get to work or even in the car, that might be the reset that you need and it might only take two minutes. That's it. And I think it's, you know, what are the, the tools and the strategies that you can incorporate in the midst of your day? We might not always have the you know however long in the morning silent to sit and meditate but what can we do throughout the day that can help us along the way I'd love if you could if you could share a few more of the slivers and um, slices and slabs yeah okay so I'll start with the big ones the slabs are the things that I say take you know you might take I took years before I could get on my first yoga retreat right which was in India um and it took me years to organize to do a Vipassana because 10 days away and having care for the kids and things like that. So after, um, before you get to those things, maybe, um, uh, like a, a slice might be something that you aim to do a bit like you might um, aim to do it daily. Um, might be half an hour, 15 minutes. So a guided meditation if you don't like complete silence. And these days those things are great because they're so um, easily accessible via apps and things like that, which is one of the benefits of the thing that I keep saying is so bad for us is, <laughs> you know, um, and I always say to people, that's really, it's really important to recognize you don't have to pay. That's one of the wonderful things about meditation is it should be in most, you know, you don't have to pay a fortune. Please don't think that you get better if you pay for something like that. You can do start doing a thing on, on one of the free apps. Um, and it doesn't have to be long. In fact, depending on the meditation, between 8 and 15 minutes daily will start to have an impact. It's as long as you sustain the practice. So And start with a, a guided one if you need to. Um, don't feel like you have to sit in a stool or a cushion. Good teachers will tell you, you know, it's about, you know, what works for you. It's what do, you're doing in your mind, not how much like a yogi you look like. But again, if you're not comfortable with that, um, I often say that walking in nature um, is a meditation in itself. And I don't, and yes, you can do forest bathing or slow walking, but even at the very, very least, lose the ear pods don't listen to anything and that might feel really weird and just say, give yourself permission to just go for a, a 15 minute walk or a 10 minute walk. Or if it feels confronting to do that, you know, it doesn't have to be 
the 30 minute timed, you know, I'm going to get value out of this. And my key to this, because I wasn't great at doing it, is if possible, for two reasons, women often don't feel safe bushwalking by themselves. Um, and we live on a reserve, as I've said. So um, being on my own there sometimes can just, you just naturally feel a little bit less comfortable. Um, for that reason, but also for another meditative reason, I say if you can get a dog or if you have a dog, dogs are the best introduction to nature meditation. Because if you go and being present in your environment, if you go out and watch your dog, like it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. If I think if I go out and I'm just going to watch this animal do his thing and his thing's going to be, look at this stick. That's amazing. You know, and here's another stick and here's some grass and I'm going to go over and here's a dog, another dog. And the excitement he takes or just the keen interest he takes in everything that he comes across, the smells, the sounds, the jumping into the water. It's very hard not to be present if you use your dog as your as your guru right <laughs> so that's another one in terms of um in terms of slivers those little things um a great one that um i came across it's called the half moon meditation that you can do even if you're sitting in a car in traffic is just fixing your eye like wait till you've obviously stopped at a traffic light S fixing your eyes on the light or something and just putting your mouth into like a half moon smile. So you're going to look like you're crazy, um, but it will release hormone. We know it releases chemicals to make you feel better. But then, and do the three deep belly, belly, belly breaths. Straight down low into your tummy, keeping the smile on your face. And that's all. And that's a reset. Um, I, did, I used to do one called the car park meditation when I was working in-house during COVID. I was in a very, um, uh, quite a frenetic role at the height of COVID as a communications consultant, but at the front line of some COVID research. And every day I'd get to the, to the car park and just do a turn off the car and rather than just jump out of the car and, and go straight into the next thing, sit and maybe for two minutes, name the things around you. That's all, it's like a sense, a, a sense recognition. I can see three trees. I can see two clouds. I can hear whatever. And what that does is, again, it brings you back into yourself. But it also gives your brain like a hard stop. Um, I'm, I'm, before I move from this activity, I'm doing this and now I'm going to start the next one. Um, and I'll finish by making one observation that I think is really important. Um, we, we're told we can multitask, but there's now, again, great research, I think, again, from Stanford, might be Harvard, that shows that that's a, a lie, that your, your brain is a bit like you think about having all those tabs open on your computer browser. <laughs> if you don't give yourself a hard stop between tasks, your brain keeps that tab open and it'll keep going back and going, but what about, but what about, but what about? So similarly, if you're at your desk at work or whatever task you're doing in your workplace, before going to, into a meeting or, um, you know, moving to, your, to lunch or whatever, sometimes it's just worth allowing yourself, whether you write it down or just think, um, I'm finishing this task now. This is where I, writing down, this is where I have to come back to, but I'm finishing it now. Um, allows the brain to go, right, I know what I'm doing. I can move to the next thing. Wonderful. There's some great micro practices, I feel, to create space. Um, oh, can I add one that's mm. actually just fun that yeah. I did it used to do in Sydney? Um, just in case you think it's all about meditation and being calm. I, I think I called it in the book, I called it the, the quiet quest or the quest for quiet or something like that. So at lunchtime, if you're in, particularly if you're in one of those city your offices or that you might just eat at your desk or you go across to a food court or downstairs to a cafe. What I, what I said, um, what I suggested, what I did myself was I started looking deliberately for quiet places. And here in, um, in Brisbane, where I am now, for example, the State Library is this beautiful, you know, um, architecture. It's full of these light filled places that overlook the river. Um, but often, for example, churches, 
in the city. And sometimes they're divine, you know, the gorgeous architecture. But anybody can go and sit in a church. You don't have to actually be a paid up member. And sometimes that's really nice. It's a different, it's you're giving your body this like, there's different smells in here. It's cooler, might be light from the windows. Um, so there's, you know, or, or finding a little park, a little, you know, park bench. Um, so things like that can just be, can it be fun as well as good for the soul. Bit of an exploration. I yeah. love that. Mm. Yeah. Before we go, I'd love to ask you, if you had one piece of advice or one sentence of wisdom to anyone out there who might be wanting to turn down the noise or take back their own mind, what would you say to them? <laughs> Oh, gosh. And, and here I, I wrote a book about it, so I'm full of uh, tips. To get it down to one, I would say be gentle with yourself and generous with yourself. Um, meditation teaches you um, that life is about starting again. So it's an exploration, not a I'm going to do this and I'm suddenly going to be perfect and feel great. Um, so whatever you do, allow yourself, do it with that spirit of inqui in, inquiry and, and curiosity and allow it to be a journey rather than a, a task that must be filled. Love that. God yeah. knows we don't need another task on our no. to-do list that needs to be filled. <laughs> no, no. Um, I think women particularly really suffer from that sense of, you know everything because we are all often so busy and also because we're trained not to do anything for ourselves um yeah we're often our hardest taskmasters um and you know what sometimes i'll add one more thing sometimes because it's about getting back into your animal state your senses of being in a sometimes if you just feel like you've sat down and gone i might meditate or whatever if actually what feels good is just lying down with a blanket over you or lying in the sun, do that. That's a form of connection and meditation in itself. If that's what your body tells you it needs, you know, go with that. Absolutely. Listen to that gush and that mm. instinct. It's telling you something for a reason, I reckon. Mm. Before we go, um, if anyone listening to this wants to find out more about you or the work that you do, how might they go about doing that? Well, the book Turning Down the Noise is available, um, certainly available on Amazon and Book Depository and those sorts of things. So I invite you to have a look at that or at your local library. I, I love my library. Um, I, <laughs> I am active on, uh, I have, and active on Instagram and on Twitter. Twitter is Christine Jackman, but without the A in the last name because Jackman, M-N, M-N, J-A-C-K-M-N. Um, Instagram's my name. However, I, and I've got a website in my name as well. Um, however, I also will say in my defense that I am very careful about my own social media use. So sometimes I'll be there love promoting other people's books and reading and things like that, particularly these days. Um, but I'm, and I will respond, um, but I'm not for reasons I've just given, not always on there. So yeah, but that's where you can find me. And I am working on other written work, but um, most of that will be a little while. If anyone is in, in the Byron Bay region, I'm also uh, going to be at the Byron Writers Festival this year in August. Wonderful. And um, last but not least, <laughs> do you have an ask? Is there something that we can help you with? Wow. Um, do I have an ask? Um, <laughs> my publisher will say, please just read my book. Um, <laughs> and I would just say, let's take three breaths together because I'd really need that actually this afternoon. So, um, Ash, can I ask you to lead? A breathe in, breathe out. Sure. That would be wow. a treat for me. That's my well, ask. Sure. All right. Well, get yourself comfortable. Make any little adjustments that you need to make. 
maybe you'll close your eyes or maybe you'll just soften down your gaze. And start to just feel into your body. So right at this very moment. How is the body doing? Is it feeling tired, energized, motivated? What is the actual physical sensations like of just sitting on the surface beneath you? Feel the feet on the floor, your seat against the chair, your back up against the back of the chair. And from that space now, just become aware of your breath. So just noting the natural rhythm as it draws in and out of your body. Without changing it initially, just noticing. And as you're ready, take a really full deep breath, slow right down into your belly. And then exhale really slowly all the way out. Another one like that, right down into your belly, into your rib cage, up into your chest. And then a long, slow out breath. One more in through the nose, down to the belly, the ribs, the chest. Maybe even pause when the breath is full. And then a really slow, deep breath out. And then just check back in how it is that you're doing now. And as you're ready, slowly, steadily, whenever you feel ready to do so, open back up your eyes. Thank you. How good was that? I was really not expecting that. but I'm, I know you were. I, but you're I'm all the better it. for doing it. <laughs> no, and I think that when you said and ask or ask I actually think just demonstrating with people how lovely it is just in three breaths I think that's a fantastic thing to do well, three breaths you and you turn asking. down the noise absolutely absolutely well thank you so much for Thanks, being Ash. part of this I've absolutely loved this conversation as I said I am a big fan of your book and all the work that you've done and the message that you share so um, an absolute honor to have you as a guest Fantastic. And please, anybody who does turn up or make contact, please let me know that that's the connection is through via Ash because um, I've loved being here. Thanks, Christine. Thanks.